Well, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, Martin Luther. Uh, he, the, uh, that's, Martin, that's not Martin Luther King, by the way. <laughs> Martin Luther. Um, he'd be um, 540 years old this year if you know what he lived. <laughs> um, so, um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you remember about Martin Luther? Yeah. Right. He was a rebel. He was a rebel? Yeah. yeah, I had some trouble with uh, his views on Jews. He was a Catholic. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, he was a Catholic. Yeah. Yes, he was a Catholic. He was tired of being good. <laughs> <laughs> so just because he helped. That's, that's actually true. Just I, he mean, helped. I mean, seriously. I don't. Just because we'll he went over the falls in the wine barrel. Come on. Who went over the falls in the wine barrel? His uh, wife. Have y'all heard of the indulgences? The, uh, uh, the indulgence controversy is what what sparked the 95 Theses? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, called the Holy Roman Empire. It, uh, it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. Aside from that, the name it. The, um, it was basically a loose collection of states uh, run by princes. There was an emperor, but he was kind of a figurehead. Um, the princes were the ones who were really in charge. And the prince over Luther's area was a guy by the name of Prince Frederick the Wise. And we'll talk about him later. He's a name. Whatever you hear that name, you want to go. Yay. Prince Frederick the Wise. Yay. <laughs> oh God, we're Norwegian Lutherans, there. <laughs> um, the church at this time was uh, in crisis. Uh, it's what uh, historians call a hot mess. Um, and, and, and let me say here first that the Catholic Church of then is not the Catholic Church of now. Okay, after, uh, in fact, right after Luther died, the, the uh, Catholic Church started to go through their own reformation. So, in fact, it was called the Catholic Reformation. And so they changed, got rid of a lot of the abuses and a lot of the stuff that they did. Um, so what uh, what they were so when I talk about the medieval church or the, the medieval church Catholic church then that's that's not the same thing as we um, so the church was in crisis um, it, um, it, uh, here's a here's a couple examples here um, uh, the Crusades. Crusades were a miserable failure on all on so many levels, and uh, and everybody knew it. The uh, the people at uh, in fact there was a an archbishop in uh, in Luther's day that came into town the town where Luther was and he, he was trying to get people excited for a new crusade, and the people of the town literally ran out ran him out of town. So everybody was. Everybody knew the, the Crusades had been a failure, and uh, the church had taken a big hit for that. Um, There's a lot of corruption. Um, one of the pirate, one of the popes, was a pirate before he was a pope. <laughs> um, That's good training. <laughs> popes, uh, popes, uh, popes and bishops were having illegitimate children and appointing them to high offices uh, around the empire. Um, in, in those days, the Pope uh, signed laws into, into being, and if uh, you couldn't get your law signed by the Pope, you could take it across the street to the Papal Forgery Center and <laughs> get, a, get, a, get a forgery. And, uh, and you had to pay the price, of course, and then you, and you had to pay for that, and then the, and that would go into the church coffers. 
Um, the, um, uh, there was a, a failure of pastoral care in the church. Um, there wasn't, in fact, there was no real care. There was only mandates. You know, you have to give uh, money to the church. You have to confess your sins. Uh, you have to come to mass. You have to, you know, have to come to communion. Um, there were uh, no Bibles in the uh, common language. The um, uh, all the Bibles were written in Latin, and by this time nobody could speak Latin anymore, except scholars. And so um, uh, nobody could read. Nobody could read the Bible, even when they you know read the Bible in church. It was in Latin. Still couldn't understand. Um, the uh, priests spoke. Uh, Latin in the in the services, <coughs> um, so they do the the mass. It was entirely in Latin, and nobody could understand it. So people just kind of sat there for for an hour. And the uh, the ma the, uh, 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 the 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 priests um, didn't. Uh, they weren't trained. They weren't formally trained. So they learned Latin from another priest who didn't know Latin either, <laughs> who had learned it from another priest who didn't know Latin. And so the Latin became garbled over the years. Um, in fact, one of the, uh, if you've all heard the word hocus pocus. Um, the, uh, one, of the, I, one of the theories for how that word started was it, will, it was a garbalization of the Latin phrase, this is my body. Oh, oh. So it's hot pestle. Hakas Pasme Pakme or something. So um, oh, that's interesting. Um, so um, the um, uh, church had a lot of superstitions, a lot of uh, still had a lot of pagan beliefs from the from the um, uh, fr from the old uh, Germanic religions. Uh, so things like uh, they. Uh, they thought that the, the peasants thought that the body and blood of Christ were, were magic. And so the uh, moms would take the wafer and put it in their purse and mm -hmm. take it home and give it to grandma who was sick. You know. Or they, they'd nail it up um, above the sheep during breeding season, you know, because they thought there would be magic there. Um, a lot, of, a lot of people believed in fairies and gods of the forest and all that kind of stuff. Um, Luther's mom was a big believer in that stuff, and that kind of passed down to, to Luther a little bit. Um, there was a constant fear of hell in, uh, in, in, the, in the church. Uh, so you had to confess, like for example, you had to confess every sin that you committed. And, uh, and if you didn't, if you missed one, guess what? Straight, straight to hell. Oh. Straight to hell. If you, forgot, if you forgot to confess a sin, boy, that was, uh, that was a one-way ticket to hell. The, uh, uh, there was a belief in what was called purgatory. Purgatory was um, a place for every sin you committed, you had to... Um, spend seven years in purgatory before you could get on to heaven. Okay? So, um, <laughs> and, uh, apparently they had wait, the folding chairs in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, the, um, and so, and, and so, it, you know, seven years per sin, that, that kind of adds up, you know. And so, hundreds of thousands of years people are sitting and waiting in purgatory before they can go in uh, into heaven. Um, so, um, so how do you get out of purgatory? Luckily, the church had an app for that. <laughs> the, um, um, you could buy an indulgence, which was a piece of paper signed by the Pope getting you out of a certain number of years of purgatory. So you could get out of five years of purgatory if you didn't have very much money. But if you had a lot of money, you could get out of hundreds of thousands of years of purgatory. And you can take, you could buy these indulgences for your, for your um, friends and family and neighbors and, and stuff too. So um, the other way to get out of purgatory was to go see a relic, and they were often kept in in little boxes like this. 
And of course, you had to pay for the opportunity to go see the, the relic. But a relic was something like, you know, it's a sliver of the piece of the cross that Jesus was crucified on, or a fingernail of St. Brunhilde, or, or um, you know, a cloth from Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, or, you know, whatever. It had all kinds of these things uh, floating around. And if you paid your money and went in to see these things, you'd get out of uh, uh, get out of purgatory. Um, and into this church, um, Martin Luther was born in 1483. Questions, comments so far? In the 60s, purgatory was still a Yeah, okay. yeah, the, and it still is. It's still on the books. In the, in, they've never repudiated it, but. Uh, but today they, they they don't talk about it. You know they're kind of embarrassed about it. And, and Lutherans have those things too. They are embarrassed. But we're we're embarrassed by you know Luther uh, uh, Luther's views on the Jews, and we don't talk about that much. But uh, uh, they also approve dancing. That's real tough when you go to a school when you can't touch each other. Dance and square dancing. Mm -hmm. This is this is. Not quite on the subject, but when, the, when was the Bible put in the hands of the people? That, it, as far as the, the translations, they they were it, it was all along. It was um, little pieces of it were translated uh, into the into the words of the people as early as 600 uh, A.D. Uh, it got so much that the church finally declared it illegal to do that. You would be thrown in jail if you translated the Bible into the language. Because, you know, they wanted to control that stuff. But, but people did it anyway. There was translations into English uh, in the 1200s. Um, Luther's translation was by far the best. And once he did it, uh, uh, there was no stopping the translations. Because people really wanted it. Uh, what in the translations. But it was also the invention of the printing press. It? Ah, good, yes. At the same time. So. <laughs> yep. Well, in fact, we're going to talk about that in a second. So, yeah. <laughs> I was curious, you know, what percentage of people can you read? Like, Greek or Latin? Does anybody just tell us so much? No, but every time they discover something, they realize that more people could read than they thought. Really? So uh, we used to think that, you know, Every, nobody could read, but not only most people could. Most people could do pretty basic things. Um, so, yeah. so when you translate the Bible to German, most of them could read. Mm -hmm. Good. Other? All right. Well, let's. Um, so uh, Luther was terrified of an angry God because the church then said you have to earn God's approval, right? And you, how, how did you earn it? You earned it by going to mass, going to going to communion, alms, giving your alms, giving your, alms. Your, giving your money to church, um, uh, fasting, praying. If you did all that. <laughs> Uh, then, then God would give you grace so that you could go to heaven. But if you didn't do that stuff, then you wouldn't get grace. And boy, you better make sure you do enough of those things. Okay, and that's one of the things that Luther struggled with, is how do I know I'm doing enough of those? And a whole lot of good works, too. And good Gotta works. Gotta do good works. You Gotta do those good, good works, yeah. Good. Um... So, uh, yeah, Luther's problem was, you know, how do I know I'm, you know, if, if you're supposed to pray, if the church says to pray for 30 minutes a day, well, how do I know that's enough? Maybe I should pray for an uh, hour a day, you know, that, that kind of thing. Maybe you could skip a day. Pardon? Maybe you could skip a day. Well, <laughs> you know, maybe you go every other day. Pray six hours in one day. Thank you, Good for the week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, well, this was Luther's view of God. <laughs> um, he really believed that God was walking around with a fly swatter ready to swat anybody who did something bad or believed something wrong or didn't do enough going to church, giving money, praying, 
good works, et cetera. Okay? And, uh, and, and he was just, Luther was just terrified of going to hell at any given moment, at any given moment. So um, he went to um, college, um, got his BA, then he went in, and then he, um, uh, his father really wanted him to become an, a lawyer so he could make a lot of money and take care of the parents when they died, or when they were old. Um, so Luther went into law for uh, a, a, you know, a master's degree for one month, and then he quit because he hated it so much. Um, and just about that time, um, he was uh, walking home from, uh, uh, Luther was walking home from a bowling with his friends, uh, and he was walking through a forest, and um, uh, lightning hit, the, hit a tree right next to him, and he blurted out, um, I will become a monk. Because monks had the best shot at heaven. <laughs> even better than priests, even better than... Because monks, man, they prayed like uh, seven times a day. They had prayer services and they had... Um, uh, it, it, you know, they went to choir all the time and they had, uh, did good works. And if, if you really wanted to go to heaven, your best shot at it was, was being a monk. Um, so he went to the Augustinian Monastery, which was the best, uh, the, the, the harshest of all the um, of all the uh, of all the monk school, schools. Um, and there he did um, everything that he was supposed to do, but he was still terrified. Um, he uh, confessed his sins constantly to his father confessor, and so. You know, he'd go, um, and most people would just, you know, if, if it had been a week since their visit with the father confessor, they'd just tell him the last week of sins. But Luther went every day. And he not only told that day's sins, he went all the way back to his birth and recounted every sin he had ever done because he was afraid of missing anything. Because if you miss one sin, guess what? Going to hell. Yeah, straight to hell, yeah. <laughs> Worse than some years. So, it, you know, he, uh, uh, Luther believed that uh, God had a giant chalkboard in, in heaven. And every time somebody would write a sin, uh, they would, uh, or, I'm sorry, every time Luther or anyone would sin, they'd write, the, some angel would write it on the chalkboard. And when you confess your sin to a priest, then they erase it. But if you forgot, you know, if, if, there, if you die and there's even one sin left on the chalkboard, straight to hell. <laughs> okay. So, um, so he confessed the sins constantly, you know, and most, most monks would do, you know, a few minutes of, of um, confessing their sins to their father confessor. And Luther would go three, four hours uh, <laughs> confessing his sins. And so finally, you know, his, his, his father confessor was actually a really good guy, tried to help Luther understand grace. It, one, one time he says, he tells Luther, Luther, why don't, you, why don't you try loving God for a change? And, you know, Luther didn't want to because he was terrified of God. Mm -hmm. you know? And so finally, um, his father confessor uh, ordered him to become a professor. Anything is better than making him... You know, sitting around here <laughs> moping about his sins, <laughs> me having to listen to you know Luther would Luther would would uh, uh, talk about stuff like you know I passed gas in church. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I know what Luther's father confessors finally said, "Geez, if you're gonna sin, sin boldly. You know, bring me something that I can." Do. What was he doing when he wasn't sitting? <laughs> he was just doing monk stuff. <laughs> so um, um, he uh, he went to uh, he didn't want to become a professor, um, but uh, but they they made him. His father confessor made him. So he went to the University of Wittenberg to become a uh, professor. He became a professor of the Bible. And that really forced him to read the Bible, um, to, to, to get into the Bible deeply. Um, okay, questions, comments?
<coughs> so just stepping back a bit, you're referring to um, if you forget a sin, you go straight to hell. But isn't purgatory then better than hell? Because you can get your way out of purgatory. So who yeah, ends up in purgatory? If, you, uh, <laughs> if you're, you're going to go to hell, it takes time. you go straight there. You don't stop in purgatory. It takes you terrible right. time. You only stop in purgatory if you're going to hell. So does everybody make their, make their way to heaven that way? Um, no, you, so it, the ones who are going to hell, according to the Catholic, medieval Catholic Church, if you die and, and you're headed for hell, you just go to hell. Right. But if you're headed for heaven, you still have to wait in purgatory for however many years, and then you eventually get to heaven. People have to buy your way out of purgatory. And it helps if people buy your way out faster. Oh, so, well, why couldn't one? Luther do that? Huh? Well, obviously he didn't want to do that, but that's the result. But why couldn't he? I understand Janet's. Why did he think he was headed for hell? He must have had some really nasty sins. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why? why because, because everybody had this opportunity to go to purgatory. It's, who decides you go? He won't. Personally, he decided he was going to hell. Yeah. He he was he was afraid of going to hell. He wasn't. He was sure afraid. He was, yeah. He wasn't well, sure he was going. To this hell. this thing about keeping score. Uh, the is the is Muslims Islam believes there's a book where it is written down. Mm -hmm. So he must have thought like that. That was like, yeah. That could be. Uh, influenced by that. Yeah. When was hell created? <laughs> no. No. Yeah. We could do a six-week series on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's left the, over uh, from the, the early, most of, most people in the early church didn't believe in hell. Uh, it was started uh, uh, in the medieval church. Oh, okay. Because they needed a way to control people, and because they really liked the Greek idea of God the Hades. So is, is hell still a, a, a human invention? Is it still a human invention? Um, much of the church doesn't think so. Or I'm uh, well. Well, it, hell, hell is not. Hell is the absence of of God. Yeah, as that's I what, understand. That's what. There are some. You know, it's it's a spectrum line. There's a. Some people think it's a place of eternal torture and burning fire. And then there's people who, who say, well, no, it's just, it's just separation from God. Well, and then some people who say, well, it's just kind of a, you, you just, uh, you, you just kind of go away, you, you disappear. Yeah. And then there's people who say, and, and I'm in this camp down here, that there's, um, there's, there's no help. It's a, it was a Greek, it, it, it was, they, they uh, took the Greek idea of hell and, and just kind of incorporated that and took some passages out of context. And it, it's thing, it, they took out passages like uh, when Jesus talks about um, uh, better to, better to uh, sin, or better not to sin than to be thrown into hell is what is in most of your Bibles, um, the uh, he, but actually the, the uh, it's a it's a phrase called the Valley of Gehenna, and that was an actual place outside Jerusalem where they burned their garbage, and so Jesus wasn't talking about eternal life. He was like, you don't want to be a criminal, so mm -hmm. that's kind of what he's. But that's a well, it's a good, good topic to, for a Bible study. <laughs> um, other other questions so far on Luther. And his, yeah. Um, just one more, because I remember learning when I was in junior high and high school from my Catholic friends, and you don't hear about this anymore, a mortal sin or a venial yeah. sin. Yeah, yeah, you don't really, that was, that's kind of a, they decided that was kind of a, not a very helpful concept. Well, um, yeah. Again, it's still in the books, but. Yeah. Well, wasn't venial sin going to get you into purgatory and mortal sin going to get you to hell? <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Mortal sins were really bad and venial sins weren't too bad. Yeah. 
That's in one of the little square books. Okay. <laughs> or the Kirchbrief, at least, book book, I'm not sure. So, um, so uh, Luther made his way to uh, uh, the University of Wittenberg, a new, which was a new university started by Prince Frederick the Wise. Yay. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Let's try that again. A new university started by Frederick the Wise. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so, um, uh, another guy who uh, came along was a guy by the name of Philip Melanchthon. He was a good-looking guy. He, um, um, when Philip Melanchthon was a child, his father was an armor maker. He had a really good armor maker. He was such a good armor maker that he was poisoned by the competition and died. And so uh, Philip Melanchthon had to go live with his uncle Roy. <laughs> His uncle Reutlin happened to be the best languages scholar in Europe. So he spoke uh, Hebrew and Greek, the original languages of the Bible, plus Latin and all these other ones. And uh, Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon, really picked that up quickly. He's a brilliant, brilliant languages scholar. So when Frederick the Wise, yeah. <laughs> one more time, when Frederick the Wise yeah. calls up uh, Uncle Reutlin, and says, you know, I'm starting a new university, who's your best languages scholar? <coughs> Uncle Reutlin says, that happens to be my son, my uh, nephew. And, and he was right. Um, and so Philip Melanchthon went to uh, the University of Rittenberg at the age of 21, right old age of 21. And he really became Luther's right-hand man. Um, Melanchthon is the one who taught Luther a lot of the uh, language issues. Uh, of, of Greek and Hebrew that, that uh, Luther was wrestling with. Melanchthon is the one who uh, wrote most of the um, uh, belief systems that we have now. Uh, uh, you know, Luther always wanted to go out and talk to people and give these fiery speeches. Melanchthon uh, was a quiet, studious one who wrote it all down and put it in an organized fashion. So. Um, uh, Melanchthon, uh, the, the Reformation wouldn't have happened, been able to happen without Melanchthon uh, at Luther's side. Um, and so it began. Um, the real impetus for the 95 Theses was indulgences. And a guy by the name of John Tetzel began hawking um, Indulgences. Uh, he would—he was kind of like a circus barker. He would—he would go into town and he would make a lot of noise and and have these uh, cool rhymes about how good indulgences were. And he would collect a lot of money for the church. And, and all the money he collected was going to go back to uh, build a, a cathedral in Rome. And um, in, in fact, there was a there was a very old story. It's hard to tell if it was real or if. It's a true story or not, but it kind of gives you an idea of what indulgences were like. Um, Luther, uh, uh, John Tetzel was, was <coughs> went into the office of one of the nobles in the area, and he, and he was telling him about how great indulgences were. And the noble was, nobleman was pretty interested. And, and the nobleman says, so this will get rid of all my, all my uh, past sins, and forgive those, so I won't have to spend time in purgatory. John Tetzel says yes, and um, and the nobleman says, well, what about future sins? Does that will that work too? And uh, John Tetzel says yes, it'll take care of your future sins too. So the nobleman says that's great. I'll buy buy it all. And um, so John Tetzel was driving down the road in his stagecoach a few hours later, and he was beset by thugs and soldiers who beat him up and stole his money. And John Tetzel's lying in the ditch, and the nobleman shows up and says, yeah, this was the future sin I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So, uh, so it was basic, indulgences were basically get out of purgatory free cards. And, uh, and that, that incensed Luther. Okay. Uh, they're still making fun of John Tetzel. So we were in Leipzig five years ago. 
looking at Box Church on the other side of town is Tetzel's church. Oh, right. And there's a guy standing dressed as John Tetzel selling indulgences in the street. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're making fun of him. It's almost a clownish kind of thing now. Yeah. And then we were doing uh, Reformation skits about many of these characters you described. That's why we're saying yay and boo. <laughs> <laughs> Still going on. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so on October 31st, 1517, Luther posts 95 theses, and they, they were, most of them were about indulgences and, and the problems with indulgences. You know, his first indulgence, uh, I'm sorry, his first theses, Luther's first theses, uh, said all of Christian life should be turning back to God. You shouldn't be relying on indulgences. And so he wrote 95 of these theses. And here's the thing. Um, Luther wrote them in Latin. Um, they weren't for the regular people. They were for um, scholarly debate for his students. And, and theses were a common thing that professors in those days did, is they'd write theses and then the students would debate them. Okay. Um, uh, so how did, how did they become a thing? So uh, some enterprising local printer got a hold of these, probably without Luther's knowledge, translated them into German, and figuring he could make a buck, he uh, sent them all over Germany. And suddenly, these 95 theses are in German, and they're all over everywhere, all over Europe. Yeah. And that created quite a furor because because furor 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 <laughs> it, it, it created quite a lot of commotion <laughs> because, uh, because everybody was kind of feeling this church in crisis thing and they and and here's this guy this is a here this is guess what's coming out of the University of Wittenberg right now is is uh, somebody's going up against the pole and somebody's going up against the church. And so everybody was really excited about these 95 theses. Even though there wasn't that, there wasn't too much that was theologically wrong, according to the church, with, um, with these 95 theses. Um, Luther was still a very medieval theologian. He, he still believed in purgatory at this time. Uh, he still believed, you know, he wouldn't have been led into Lutheran pulpits today for about 15 more years. So, hmm? Was this, at, at this point, was there already the Church of England? Had England already separated itself? Yeah. No. no. Not yet? Okay. It was sh very shortly after this. Yeah. The, the English king has the title Defender of the Faith, and that was because Henry VIII had opposed uh -huh. Luther, and he had been defending the Catholic Church against the Protestants. But he still retains the title, despite the fact that he split away. Yeah, 1530s. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I like Trump, yeah. I couldn't remember what Henry VIII was in all of this. Yeah. Was that what you, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, good. Thanks. But considering how many other people were thinking like he was about the mistreatment of indulgences in other countries, and when these finally were translated and sent around Europe, did that spur all the other starters of the other religions? Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of people started to to to, to talk and to do things and coalesce and things like that. So yeah. Um, so Luther's insight, you know, Luther was wondering, how do I stay righteous before God? How do I? How do I? How do I not? Uh, he was trying to break away from this chalkboard view of, of sin, you know? And um, Melanchthon helped him to understand the, 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 what was going on in the Greek of Romans uh, chapter 1 and, and, and other, uh, other passages. <clears throat> For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith, the righteous will live by faith. And Luther's insight is essentially the relentless, indiscriminate grace of God. 
that he wasn't, God wasn't this guy with a fly swatter looking to, looking to swat people. That he was a giver of grace to everybody. And, um, and there, there, there is no chalkboard for sins. It's all just grace. And it's all, um, it's all grace as uh, uh, written in, uh, that we live in our faith alone, as written in scripture alone, because of what Jesus has done alone. And that's, that's grace. Okay? That's the love of, indiscriminate love of God. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, um, Prince Frederick the Wise uh, protected Luther. Um, the um, Pope really wanted to arrest Luther. Uh, the Emperor really wanted to arrest Luther, but nobody wanted to go up against Prince Frederick the Wise because he was he had a, he was pretty tough. He was a tough guy. Um, he hid Luther in Castle Wartburg, um, where uh, Luther translated the Bible into German, okay? and that's where uh, Prince Frederick uh, the Wise yeah. enabled all this to happen. <clears throat> Um, so uh, Luther continues to write prolifically, including uh, translating the, he finished the, old, the New Testament and then he translated the Old <laughs> Testament, but he, he kept making it better. He, um, uh, he, when he was struggling with, um, struggling with a passage and how to say something, he, Luther would like go down to the butcher shop and talk to people and say, how would you say this? Mm -hmm. if, you know, and so he really got a, it, it was a really common language way of reading the Bible, and that's uh, that's why this one was the best uh, the best translation so far of all the common language translations. Um, he in 1525 he married Catherine von Bora. He said uh, he married her to spite the Pope and the devil. <laughs> um, and in 1530. Um, uh, Melanchthon wrote what was called the Augsburg Confession, which was something that uh, Lutheran princes were, were able to come together and say, this is what we believe. And historians really talk about 1530 as the birth of the Lutheran Church, even though most of us say, well, it kind of started in the Reformation, or uh, with the 95 Theses, but... but um, um, so... Um, the final years of uh, Luther's life, um, he uh, continued to write, continued to improve his translation of scripture. He, he wrote just vociferously. He had increasing issues with physical and mental health. Uh, he probably had a clinical depression or bipolar, uh, both of which probably contributed to his uh, uh, meanness. Uh, toward uh, some of the Catholics and Jews and other people um, that uh, he didn't agree with or got in his way. Finally, in uh, 1546, he uh, died from a stroke uh, on his way back from Brazil to the Church Council. Questions? That's, so that's all I got on the record. <laughs> Actually, I got a lot more of it. I was born Catholic. <laughs> And uh, to yeah, look back on my life, I, I had no other influence, or no other input. Uh, and through life, you, you, you gain other bits of information that create your own volume of thinking that, hey, it ain't so bad being not Catholic. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, really, it was well, amen. amen to that. My first wife passed away, and I met a gal that was Lutheran, ELCA, and here I am. Here you <laughs> and I don't have any regrets at all. Yeah. My mother-in-law, all she was told growing up in Catholic school and so on was that Martin Luther ran off of a nun. <laughs> <laughs> and at the display at the Institute of Arts years ago, um, it was very interesting to find that if there wasn't enough money for a dowry, a lot of times the daughters ended up in the convent and they were mistreated and there was a whole group that left the, 
kind of got snuck out. And I think they were being harbored in a castle or somewhere. And of course, they should be married. They can't be. And um, and his wife chose him right. rather than being married off to someone else. Yeah. She kind of helped hold things together. I mean, she, she really was the did. Manager. <laughs> uh, she uh, held together. Uh, their family, with, you know, whether it was eight kids or twelve kids or something like that, held that together and was really a constant support to, him, to to Luther. And so, you know, we always talk about Martin Luther as the, you know, as this key figure in the Reformation. But he couldn't have done it without Prince Frederick the Rise and Philip Melanchthon and his wife and and the other faculty at the at the uh, university. And so, yeah, we uh, uh, he had a lot of help. And is it true that there was like war with Muslims or something, and so they that's part of the reason they didn't get around to? Yeah, they had <laughs> they had uh, invasions coming in from the uh, from the east, that, and so the emperor spent a lot of time dealing with that. Dealing with that so. And there were lots of other reformist movements that popped up at the same time. Right. So so even though. Luther might have spark, lit the spark. I mean, there were all sorts of other things. There was Zwingli in, in Switzerland, and John Calvin in France, and Erasmus in the Netherlands. It's, there were lots of people who had different ideas about what was correct. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, so the Reformation wasn't just Luther. Yeah. It, was, uh, it, was, it was something that that uh, bubbled up all over the place. Other, uh, I think it's neat. It, seems, it seems to me that Luther solved all those problems in scripture. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the mental and spiritual problems he had, mm -hmm. but that was an education he found a solution to all of the scripture. Good point. That's a great point. Did you all hear that? No. Uh, yeah, Luther, Luther really found his. Um, uh, all his doubts and stuff, he, he found answers in scripture. So, um, yeah, good. And the Catholics have largely adopted a lot of his proposals. Yes, yeah. he would. Catholics are today where Luther would have wanted them. <laughs> he would have never broken yeah. away. If, right. And the only things that divide us are things that are not central. Right. And I, yeah, I spent, I spent 15 years working at a Catholic university, so I'm, I'm quite <laughs> unfamiliar with, you know, what they think now. And, and, you know, even, even the scholars, Catholic scholars today, you say, well, there wasn't really that much wrong with Luther. He, he read some of the wrong people and so got a little bit more uh, tied up in a knot than he should have, but he was, he was okay. <laughs> you gotta admire some of the Catholics that stick to the old ways, though. Oh, sure. What door were the pieces nailed to? Uh, the Wittenberg Church door <laughs> at, at the university. It wasn't yeah. designed for church. No, it was a. It was like a bulletin board. Yeah. In fact, there's actually, actually some. <laughs> pardon? It was supposed to be up for debate, and then it got circulated. Yeah. Uh, there, there's even some. Uh, discussion about whether it was actually um, posted on the door or whether Luther <coughs> sent it inter campus mail. So, either way, it was posted, I guess. For, the, for that inter campus mail, did they have those old manila envelopes with the holes pushed through? <laughs> 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 the but, 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 you know, the idea of posting it on the church door is kind of what's come history. to us, because that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Well, I think this is an academic life there. Yeah. This is just an aside. My ancestor's church in Denmark posted on the, on the door the Reformation started in 1530. That's when the Danes threw the Catholics out of <laughs> and they took all our records with them. Yeah. And in, in, inside the front door, there is a great big thing, it's about eight feet tall, 
We had listed every minister that had served in church since 1530. Okay. The priest also showed us where they covered up the baptismal font from the Catholics and covered up a few other the Catholic things because they weren't nice. Mm -hmm. And they took all our records. We have no idea what we did. And they, right. then, then they eventually installed pews too. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering what Luther would think of where the church is going today. Yeah. Just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I had given you. <laughs> so you're getting there. Uh, one of Luther's ancestors studied with, studied with Luther at the University of Wittenberg. I, you said Luther's ancestors. One of mine. One of, one of Lori's. Yeah. <laughs> one of Lori's ancestors studied with Luther. Um, where would he, what would he think of today? That's a good question for. We are out of time, darling. <laughs> so, um, it's so uh, it's in your head. Yeah, great questions, and uh, thanks very much for your kind attention. And we'll thank you, Joe. Thank you. No.